Okay, well, we are now ready with our, our final session of the day, uh, our panel on what is a sustainable Arctic. And so I'll hand it over to our moderator, Rachel Lorna Johnston from the University of Aquidity. Go ahead, Rachel. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us. For some of you, it's very early, others rather late in the day. Uh, we only have one hour to conclude uh, what is a sustainable Arctic. So let's start by asking our senior Arctic official, His Excellency Einar Gunnarsson, what is a sustainable Arctic? Yes, hello. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Rachel. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. And uh, when it comes to the chairmanship, uh, talking about uh, sustainable development, of course, our chairmanship program is run under the heading Together Towards the Sustainable Arctic. And uh, uh, for us, when we are talking about uh, uh, sustainable Arctic, we feel that we must look equally to the three pillars of sustainable development, meaning economic growth, social inclusion, and environmental protection. And environmental protection, and that they all have to go uh, together in a balanced way. And uh, furthermore, we believe that we have to put the uh, Arctic inhabitants at the center. Uh, when we are uh, looking at sustainable development in the region and uh, that our policies must be uh, informed by scientific research. Uh, so uh, science and knowledge uh, building are really at the heart of what the Arctic uh, Council does. And uh, uh, I sometimes say, you know, at any given time, the Arctic Council uh, will be working on close to 100 projects and, and initiatives which are uh, uh, designed to create uh, valuable uh, data and knowledge that can feed into policy recommendations uh, for our politicians in order to inform their decision making. And uh, we have, of course, various, uh, uh, various uh, examples of, of uh, these types of projects, ranging from working on climate change, uh, fostering mental health, managing biodiversity, and uh, marine ecosystems and averting uh, oil pollution risk, just to name a couple of examples. And with this substantial body of knowledge, the Council continues to produce comprehensive circumpolar assessments and reports of issues and trends that can impact uh, the Arctic environment and the Arctic inhabitants. So companies Around the, uh, uh, no, the Arctic Council and its working groups have also identified and shared good practices across a wide range of domains, including shipping, pollution prevention, waste management, economic opportunities, and environmental impact uh, assessments. Uh, and even on three occasions, the Arctic states uh, have used the Arctic Council as a venue to negotiate these three legally binding agreements uh, that we have already. Uh, uh, that we have already engaged on, uh, ranging from uh, search and rescue, uh, marine uh, uh, oil pollution and scientific cooperation. Uh, so uh, for us, uh, when we are talking about sustainable development in the Arctic, it's all about, it's all about uh, uh, achieving this balance between uh, economic uh, growth uh, uh, social development and, and uh, uh, environmental protection. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Einar. I want to turn to Liza Mack with the same question. Perhaps uh, Liza represents the Elite International Association, AIA, so maybe you can also give us an Indigenous perspective on sustainable development. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to participate on this very important, um, on this very important panel. Um, we, the Aleut International Association, we represent the Aleut people in both Alaska and Russia. Um, and we live in the region of Alaska that um, reaches out from the end of the Alaska Peninsula all the way to um, Russia. And we've lived here for 10,000 years. So when we think about sustainability, we think about how important it is to be in our place and the fact that we have the longevity of having been in our place for um, so long. So we've 
as time has gone on since we've been here, we've seen many changes in our um, economy. Our culture today is still based on the ocean as it has been for thousands of years. Um, but our economy changes as the world economy changes and the way that we um, operate in it um, certainly changes as time goes on as well. Um, from our perspective, uh, we see a sustainable Arctic much like as we would see a sustainable community in, um, in the Aleut region. Uh, we would like to see one that promotes culture and allows the people of the Arctic to stay in our communities. Um, and we would like to see within our communities being able to have uh, safe and reliable healthcare, um, education, communication, transportation, um, being able to have a, a diversified and also um, diversified and concrete uh, economy and be, people be able to make a living wage within our communities. Um, we believe that having a voice in policy creation, especially in fora like the Arctic Council, is a very positive way that we see this happening. Um, we're happy to provide our views and support of um, other Indigenous and small communities in the Arctic, and we feel like um, by participating in the Arctic Council, it's a unique opportunity to share not only our perspective, but to um, help to ensure that other Indigenous voices are being considered in um, these conversations. Um, and so I guess in short, I, being able to remain in our place and to continue our cultural practices and um, still be able to participate in the greater economy and do so in a, um, in a positive way is what we feel is important. Um, thank you. Thank you, Liza. Yes, of course, after thousands and thousands of years of sustainable living, you perhaps have a lot to teach uh, as the relative newcomers to the Arctic about how to do this better. Turning to Andrei Petrov, Andrei is not only the president of IASA, but also the chair of the Social and Human Working Group of IASC. Um, what can you tell us about sustainable de development and how can we think about it as equitable development, uh, given what you know about social and human development in the Arctic? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, thank, thanks for having me here. I think as uh, both Einar and Eliza said, I mean, sustainability in the Arctic is sustainability with human face. I think it's very important to focus on human aspects and ensuring thrivability of Arctic community is the first and most important goal of sustainable development. The definition of sustainable development I prefer um, is a development that ensures and uh, improves well being, health, security uh, of Arctic residents and communities while preserving ecosystem structures, functions, and resources. In that way, we um, make sure that the focus is staying on improving and making sure that we have thriving communities while, of course, uh, uh, ensuring preservation of environment. There, uh, from science perspective, of course, there are a variety of uh, things we could uh, uh, discuss here. But of course, first of all, sustainability is uh, tightly connected with uh, thinking of resilience as a system's ability to persist which of course indigenous peoples demonstrated throughout the generations. At the same time, it's also based on adaptive capacity, which is ability to live with uncertainty and change, which also indigenous communities have demonstrated. And all, that's sort of part of the legacy that Arctic has. That's why I always say that Arctic in some ways is a very interesting, maybe key region for us to understand sustainability not just as uh, Arctic researchers or residents, but also around the world because Arctic could, could teach and could show a lot of things uh, to other places, uh, how to, things could have been done and how we could do it in the future. I think that's very special role that we play as Arctic residents and Arctic scientists. The, uh, in terms of the Arctic sustainability science, which is now kind of a separate or emerging field of study, uh, we have uh, gone through a, a variety of stages by starting 20 years ago, at looking at human impacts of change, of climate change, and evolving to understanding coupled human natural systems, moving on to uh, examining socio-ecological systems with intertwined systems of uh, humans and environment that exist in the Arctic and very vividly present in the Arctic. And now we're talking about, uh, you know, understanding this in terms of transdisciplinary work, uh, engaging uh, uh, diversity of knowledge systems, indigenous knowledge, of course, and, and the Western science knowledge working together to achieve what we call these days convergence approach in which um, 
we work across different knowledge systems to address important challenges that communities and the Arctic are facing today. I think another uh, emerging feature of Arctic uh, sustainability science and its uh, uh, decolonial nature, we're trying to decolonize the concept because sustainable development has come from Western um, understandings and we need to enrich it with a new understanding that indigenous communities, indigenous knowledge holders provide for us. And I think again, in this, we are uh, ahead of other regions or other places and we could, we could uh, sort of show some uh, progress uh, and we'll be showing some progress to the global, if you will, sustainability, sustainability science. So, uh, so I think that's sort of the uh, um, important threads that we have in, in our scientific work. I think, again, it requires us to work together uh, between natural sciences, social sciences, and the indigenous knowledge system, and uh, not just uh, sort of in terms of uh, uh, working together in the research project, but also working together to secure funding and ensure that we have equitable funding to all participants of this work, which is, of course, is a prerequisite for successful sustainability science in the Arctic in the future. So that's sort of a few words for me. Thank you, Andre. Before I go any further, I just remind you to those who are watching um, that you can use the Q&A box if you type in any questions there for the participants as we go along. After they've given their introductions, we can then uh, direct some more specific questions to them. I want to turn now to Alevtina Evgrafova, who is the Fellows Coordinator for IASC and one of the, I think it's fair to say, the youngest member of our panel. What do you think about sustainable development, uh, especially from a youth perspective, thinking about future generations and, and given that you're going to inherit the earth from us Crowd. Thanks a lot for inviting, first of all. Yeah, I absolutely agree with uh, Einar, Liza and Andre. And uh, I think um, Arctic indeed can be a role model. And uh, Arctic also a role model for early career researchers, how to uh, collaborate, how to establish a further um, future uh, of the Arctic development, including sustainable Arctic development. And what I also wanted to add to Andrei's definition of sustainable Arctic development, I absolutely agree, yes, Arctic should focus on the improvement of well-beings while the ecosystem is being sustained. And maybe what I would like to add by adapting and implementing technology and innovations. I think many of the young uh, researchers, early career researchers, I should say, will be agreeing with me. You know, today I closely followed the talks uh, by other um, presenters as well. So the, where the message uh, on the importance of scientific collaboration, despite the language barrier, as well as the capacity building, circular economy, involvement of stakeholders, so actors, especially the focus uh, on the indigenous peoples, was certainly a red thread during the day. And I absolutely, absolutely agree with this. And I think I would like to add that also funding and topics would be beneficial as well to, to move towards the um, sustainable Arctic development. So such a, one of them can be the technological solutions. So because it will be solving many issues. So I would say that the inclusion of the engineers, either marine or civil engineers, as well as the IT developer, of course, the entrepreneur opportunities would be created as well as the gender equality will be um, addressed. And of course, another point, which I also would like to specify is the, that, yes, we need to, to have the tools uh, in order to trans transfer the scientific knowledge to the policy. And I would say that um, I recently came across with the publication uh, uh, by Heinen. So it's called Arctic Policies and Strategies Analysis, Synthesis and Trends. And I would say that here we, we have the opportunity and the foresight uh, tools were used. So for instance, we could use the scenarios as a governance tools in order to define possible future development. So it will be um, really relevant for all the early research, uh, early career researchers, as well as uh, to the young uh, generation of the Arctic. So with this, I would like uh, to say that this would be my contribution to, towards uh, 
sustainable Arctic development. Thank you. Turning now to Brynhildur Bjartnadottir. Brynhildur is a docent at University of the Akureyri and an expert in natural science, particularly focusing on the role of forestry and carbon sequestration. Brynhildur, we've heard a lot about social and human development. Avaltina has uh, talked a little bit about um, the role of science and technology. What do you see as the role of science in, in promoting sustainable development in the Arctic? Yes, thank you. First of all, thanks for uh, having me here. Uh, Many of the things or the points that I would like to discuss have already been said, but my background uh, gives me maybe a little bit of a different perspective than the others. As a scientist working within the field of natural science and with a specific focus on ecosystems and their capacity to be sustainable, I would define uh, a sustainable Arctic as a place or an area where ecosystems, um, both on land and sea, are healthy and where humans are aware of how their economic and social welfare depends on nature and its resources. Um, ecosystems do provide a lot of services for humans. This we already know, and we can divide these services into three different parts. Uh, provisioning services like food and biomass, cultural services like landscape or spiritual things. And then we have like regulating services, uh, flood regulation, soil erosion control and stuff like that. So. Keeping in mind these three fundamental roles of ecosystem, ecosystem services, I do believe that in order to have a sustainable Arctic, we need to be aware of how we are using uh, the natural resources and we need to understand the processes behind them. And also we need to reconnect or we need to connect this uh, understanding to our economic and social well-being and give uh, people and scientists the fundamental thinking of how this all is related. Uh, to my opinion, we need more research, uh, just plain natural research. All the three fundamental pillars of sustainability are important. Uh, we need to monitor, we need to protect, and we need to understand how environmental production and social well-being is going in hand with economic development uh, of, all, of the people living in Arctic communities. Um, uh, data tells us that, and of course we all know, that climate change is affecting the Arctic more dramatic than other parts of the world, and processes like uh, melting of ice, uh, higher sea levels, changes in circulations of the ocean, and among with me methane releases from former permafrost, all these processes are ongoing, they are having a dramatic effect already, and they will in the future. And changes in these natural processes will change a lot of uh, conditions, will change the conditions of people living in the Arctic. So uh, I think that it's extremely important that we continue to collect a lot of data uh, on the effect of climate change on ecosystems. Uh, I think it's important that uh, this data is then uh, put into the hands of people that make decisions, policymakers, stakeholders, etc. Uh, and they need to understand it and keep in mind that to reach to retain a sustainable Arctic, uh, we have to make sure that our ecosystems are healthy so they can produce the services that we actually need from them. So I would uh, think that this broad uh, uh, overview and the collaboration between uh, groups working within the natural field, within the social field and uh, economic field is is a link that we always should keep in mind and try to focus on. So I think that would be uh, my, my uh, view of the, of the situation. Thank you, Brynhildur. We have already three questions in the Q&A, so please, please add some more questions as we're going along when you think of issues you'd like to direct to the panelists. Um, the first is probably more suitable for Einar. It is how about it's about cooperation between the Arctic Council and the Arctic e Economic Council, and how that promotes some sustainable development. And have there been any concrete initiatives between Arctic Council and Arctic Economic Council um, to promote sustainable development in the Arctic? Yes, thank you, uh, thank you, Rachel, and uh, the. Arctic Economic Council is really a forum uh, for cooperation between the uh, uh, between uh, let's say Arctic companies and companies uh, uh, operating or interested in the Arctic. Uh, it was set up at the initiative of the of the Arctic Council. There was a special working group uh, within the Arctic Council that prepared its foundation, 
but uh, uh, as it was up and running some five years ago uh, or a little bit more than five years ago it is uh, it is then working on its own uh, without interference from the arctic states however it's uh, it's set up uh, in many ways mirrors the setup uh, from the arctic council it has uh, several uh, working groups that are focusing on elements uh, relating to sustainable development as uh, the arctic council does and uh, it also has taken from the Arctic Council uh, uh, setting up or providing for a, a special uh, uh, involvement uh, by representatives of the Arctic indigenous communities. Uh, now, what we are doing under this chairmanship, uh, uh, we are continuing the work of, uh, that uh, started already under the Finnish chairmanship of strengthening the cooperation between the Arctic Council and the Arctic Economic Council. Uh, during the Finnish chairmanship, we, uh, we negotiated and signed an MOU between the two councils on how they could cooperate. And last fall, we held the first uh, meeting, joint meeting of the two councils, uh, focusing on explaining how we are approaching uh, our, our task in respective manners and identifying uh, how we can uh, further cooperate. And for example, I will name only one example here, and that is that uh, under the Arctic Council, we've been looking at the uh, connectivity for quite a, quite a while, uh, how, how, how to improve connectivity. Uh, it's not only telecommunications, but uh, also uh, other types of, of, of connections, whether it is transport or, or something else. And uh, we have now come to the conclusion that the Arctic Council will hardly be doing anything more in terms of analyzing the situation. Uh, so it would really be up for the private sector to take on, you know, uh, the next actions and uh, and uh, maybe the private sector would then come forward with some kind of encouragement to the public uh, to the public sector of of uh, of, uh, of focusing on some aspects regulatory aspects or some kind of measures that could facilitate the private sector uh, taking on the challenges that uh, uh, come along with operating up in the Arctic. So this is just one example of how the two councils can uh, can cooperate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Einar. Moving on to a rather more controversial question that usually comes up in these panels. Can oil and gas development in the Arctic be sustainable? Can it be a part of sustainable development? Um, would anyone like to grab that ball? Any volunteers? Liza? Oh, so Andre, and then Andre? Well, Liza could go ahead. No. Okay. Well, I just just want to say if uh, if you uh, words, of course, it's a, it's a difficult question. I think uh, in many uh, areas, as we know, resource activities have constituted the economic base for many years and will probably continue to do so. I think what's important in this conversation is uh, think of, thinking of benefit sharing and how the benefits of extractive activity are being shared with uh, local communities, with indigenous communities, with everyone who is involved, uh, but especially with uh, rights holders and stakeholders and knowledge holders who provide access and uh, who are, uh, you know, live in those areas and uh, who have rights or traditional uh, activities that are associated with that. I think that's very important. I think uh, it um, has been happening in the Arctic and uh, in some places we have fairly reasonable systems, but uh, there is no ideal one. But I think again, uh, when we talk about resource activity, as it goes uh, to connect to sustainability, sustainable development, benefit sharing is a key. So how do we equitably share the benefits of this activity with everyone else and specifically with, with the uh, indigenous and local people who are there? And, uh, and from benefit sharing, actually, we could, if we talk about kind of continuum of that, we could go to, uh, uh, so, so benefit sharing, benefit co-management as the next stage when companies and uh, communities co-manage the benefits together, not that companies sort of negotiate, but actually they work together and then possibly to benefit sovereignty, which is when uh, communities themselves are actually having the benefits and they share it if they will uh, with, with the companies to, who uh, do industrial activity. So it's kind of distant future, but that's sort of the trajectory that could give us some of the opportunities to still have sustainable development while uh, undertaking extractive activities in the Arctic. Thank I would you, just Andre. like to, uh, Liza. Uh, yeah, I guess I would just like to um, build on what Andre started mentioning as far as um, benefit sharing stuff. Is that 
this actually brings up a really good opportunity for uh, people to be very engaged and have a meaningful engagement with um, Arctic communities and indigenous communities in order to see whether or not this is something that they believe um, would benefit them at all. Um, and so I think that I would just, as far as the topic goes, just encourage uh, people to um, not only to be optimistic and um, be uh, kind of diligent, I guess, about your communications with indigenous communities and Arctic communities when you talk about these things, because it's, it's really easy to have a 30,000 foot level uh, view of the situation, but until you understand what's happening at the local level with, um, within communities, I don't think it's, um, I don't think that there is one answer for uh, that fits all. And so um, just being open-minded about the, um, the issue and understanding that the needs are different for different communities within the Arctic. Thank you, Liza. Enish? Yes, uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, I would just uh, very, very briefly like to say, of course, that the, the Arctic Council as such is not uh, so much engaged with management of uh, natural resources. So it's not re engaged in, 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 in uh, how and, and, and if uh, uh, our uh, carbon resources up in the Arctic uh, should be or, uh, or will be utilized. However, we have several projects uh, uh, ongoing in the Arctic Council relating to uh, how it is done. And there, the guiding light, I dare to say, is that uh, whatever is uh, taking place up in the Arctic should be uh, kept to a very high standard. Uh, you see, the, I already referenced the, uh, the uh, marine oil spill agreement that we negotiated within the auspices of the Arctic Council. And there are several projects ongoing in the Council uh, uh, trying to make sure that whatever is done there is done uh, according to the highest standards and uh, as, as much as possible uh, uh, taking the sensitive balance uh, of the Arctic uh, uh, and the needs in terms of environmental protection into account. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Of course, the, uh, many years ago and continually updating, PAME has been working on Arctic oil and gas guidelines for offshore drilling to try and protect uh, um, and encourage oil and gas companies and governments to regulate to the highest possible standards. Um, so we can only hope that where there is uh, activity that they are meeting those best practices. Um, slightly less controversial question. Everyone tends to agree that gender equality is really important in the Arctic, um, but we're not necessarily quite so good at actually implementing that. So any uh, thoughts? Um, this was addressed primarily to Al Alatina, who mentioned in her opening remarks the importance of gender equality. How do we actually realise that and what do we mean by gender equality? Because there are, of course, areas in which uh, women are doing much better than men and there are areas, of course, where um, women still are at a significant disadvantage. Sure, thank you, Rachel. I can take for now and then somebody can add more, of course. Um, so to start with the definition, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's a quite uh, a range uh, of the topics which can be addressed here. But maybe I will just give an example to make uh, the logic into the explanation and what I meant. So. Of course, the gender equality means providing the same rights uh, that, you know, everyone would have the same opportunity to an access to the resources as well and so on and so forth. But what has been shown by many research groups is that as soon as we implement the gender equality, it means that the females and males um, Arctic, uh, for instance, Arctic uh, community uh, members, you know, could um, have the access to the same, for instance, position or education or being involved in a certain business. So if you ask, um, for instance, indigenous uh, uh, people, uh, how many of them, especially of females, traveled abroad to get education in order to return uh, back home in order to become maybe a governor or to take any other leadership positions. So, and then here we come to the point that uh, here the key point that the access, for instance, to the education will open the door for a leadership position or will open the door for entrepreneurship. 
And then we know, and uh, it's been proven by different research groups again, that um, females are mostly uh, focusing on, for instance, uh, business towards the um, human well being, uh, service oriented, or so called community oriented projects. So, for instance, uh, mental uh, health can be addressed in this case. So I would also mention that uh, there are a few groups uh, in the Arctic scientific communities, for instance, WOA, which stands for Women of the Arctic, as well as uh, there is the um, ASSA working group, Gender in the Arctic. So please uh, feel free to contact uh, those uh, researchers as well. And maybe somebody else would like to add more. Please feel free to do it. Would anyone else like to follow up on gender equality issues? Enu? I will be very short. Of course, gender equality, it's both uh, right and smart to focus on gender equality. Uh, achieving gender equality is the, uh, is the single most important thing we can do in order to improve human rights all over. Uh, so, that's uh, looking at it from the rights perspective, but it's also smart because if you're looking at, uh, at uh, communities, uh, not allowing uh, uh, certain parts of our communities to achieve their fullest potential, it uh, simply does not make sense. It's limiting our possibilities and uh, maybe the most, most important resource that we have uh, up in the Arctic uh, is the human resource and we have to make sure that we are giving everyone of our communities up in the Arctic the, full, uh, the possibility of, of achieving their full potential. So it's also smart in that regard. Thank you. Thanks, Einar. Uh, turning to Brynhildur, you're an educationalist, you're a teacher as much as any other thing, uh, and a scientist. Um, how do you see education and the role of education in developing Arctic sustainability? I see the role of education as a huge uh, factor uh, in trying to make the next generation more uh, uh, more focused on uh, what sustainability is and how uh, their role uh, in building up the future can affect how uh, the road that we are heading to towards sustainability. So I think that the educational and the school system has good and, and rather and very large potential to work um, with the authorities to build up societies where there's more emphasis on sustainability, try to uh, build up the, 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 uh, the, the, the perfect con con conditions for, for people to grow up where they know that not only the school system, but also the community they are living within are making them more aware about what sustainability is, uh, utilize their home, home conditions, their society, try to give them access to nature as much as they can. So um, if to answer this question, I would say that the school system and the educational system has great potentials and that every country within the Arctic should put a lot of emphasis on trying to strengthen the part of education uh, towards a sustainable Arctic. Thank you, Brynhildur. I have a question now from our resident Fulbright Arctic scholar, Barry Zellin. What can the Arctic teach the rest of the world on structuring sustainability in institutional form and in diplomatic, political and economic relationships between First Nations and nation states? So I think that's probably directed at Aina and Liza. One of you like to go with that? Liza, perhaps? Um, yeah, thank you. That is a that is a great question. And I think that this is a this is a very good way to um, highlight and uh, look at the way that um, indigenous communities and Arctic communities are working together to ensure that um, that we that indigenous people are having a opportunity to share uh, not only perspectives but expertise and um, also uh, bringing forward the that have built our cultures over time, and so. Um, I think that uh, the Arctic Council is unique in that it does uh, provide a opportunity for uh, the indigenous people to be at the table and to um, share our perspectives. And so um, I think that it is a, it is a great, um, uh, especially in remote communities have access to the same types of education 
just because our communities are so far out, uh, spread out and remote, uh, we have a lot of challenges actually keeping educators within our communities and actually offering uh, students the opportunity to have the same types of connectivity and technology um, as you have in larger hub communities. And so um, going forward, I think that it is a great opportunity for us to be looking at uh, making sure that everybody is on the same uh, has the same level of um, access to education and to good educators. So thanks, sorry, I got us off on a back on the last one, but. No, very important, Liza. Um, Einar, um, over to you. Yes, I would uh, simply like to concur with Liza. Uh, the, I think it's one of the crown jewels of the Arctic Council, uh, the involvement of the permanent participants on behalf of the indigenous people, uh, populations of the, of the Arctic. Uh, it provides for a, uh, I believe, uh, unprecedented way of engaging uh, uh, with uh, indigenous peoples in international cooperation. Uh, but more than that, uh, the representatives of the, in, uh, of the indigenous, uh, uh, pop, uh, of the permanent participants uh, in the work of the Arctic Council are quite often the most ex experienced people in the room. Uh, not only having the most experience of living up in the Arctic, having been there for the longest time, but also having been there for uh, sort of for longer time than anyone else uh, uh, present in those meetings. These are uh, highly valuable uh, colleagues that have been uh, there from the, some of them from the beginning and, and, uh, and uh, play a central role in the, in the operations of the Arctic Council. Thank you. Just continuing the theme of education and Indigenous involvement, one question that's come in is how can we better support Indigenous researchers, Indigenous early career and current Indigenous graduate students for a sustainable Arctic? Given what we said about the importance of Indigenous knowledge and making that bridge with traditional Western knowledge in order to have a sustainable Arctic, how can we actually give those young people the skills they need to bring forward and, and, and help us understand the knowledge they're coming with? Um, especially when we know we have big communications gaps uh, in uh, the more remote Arctic settlements. Aleph, Tina, would you like to say something on that? Sure. Um... I think uh, one of the opportunities, uh, of course, it uh, would be providing more scholarships for the indigenous uh, peoples and uh, as well as uh, setting up uh, more of the online education, maybe a short, uh, brief uh, webinars, which will be accessible for across the, the world, then it will definitely improve also the education and uh, the opportunity of uh, sharing know-hows. And uh, as well as uh, I think this is really necessary and it's relevant not only for early career researchers and um, uh, but also for all researchers, it's that we need uh, to be able to communicate in the language which different um, actors or knowledge holders uh, are able to understand us. So in order to create the communication, we need definitely to learn how to process with the knowledge transfer. And uh, of course, I would also add another point for the early career researchers, please never be shy, always speak up, always try to reach a mentor. So for instance, you can always Google online and uh, find uh, a professor or um, a senior researcher who is working on the particular issue you are facing, um, like within your research, or if you need just the moral support, you can always look for the mentors who are available for the early career researchers. Please use this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, over to Andre. Yeah, I just, just want to say, but first of all, uh, you know, uh, we are living in a time when uh, we need to be rethinking how, uh, in many ways, our system of science, especially system of funding science, is operating and how we made it, make adjustments in that system that uh, allows us to engage different knowledge systems like indigenous knowledge, for example. Right now, it's very difficult sometimes for early career or uh, mature career researchers or indigenous knowledge holders to receive funding, and we need to be thinking how we could uh, streamline our processes to make sure that's happening. 
but uh, the tide is with us in that sense. I think uh, there is an understanding that uh, these things have to be happening and that support for indigenous knowledge holders needs to be embedded into the system of our universities and the system of uh, you know, funding agencies that uh, provide support for, for science at any stage of, stage of the career. At this time, of course, uh, IASA, IAS, other associations and, uh, and funding agencies as well doing some things to engage uh, early career and indigenous knowledge holders uh, through scholarship, through uh, you know, supporting various types of engagements. But I think we need to be thinking further and uh, making sure that we have institutional transformation that comes with it. So I think that's a few years or a decade ahead, but I think that's what we should be, should be thinking about. Thank you very much. Um, one thing that's come up based on something you mentioned, Andre, was this idea of decolonizing sustainable development. Um, so perhaps you can say a few words and maybe Liza can also follow up on how we can actually go about doing that in practice. Um, and then also address to Brynhildr, um, how can we make that bridge between Western science and indigenous and traditional knowledge so that we're not going into the Arctic and telling people who live there for us, we heard 10,000 years of how to do sustainable development. Well, maybe Eliza, Eliza had uh, raised her hand in the previous one, so maybe she could segue to this and then I'll can. I'll do my best. <laughs> um, well, I think that it actually, it does uh, kind of speak to one another for sure, because the things that we're talking about as far as indigenous research and being able to um, bring in more indigenous researchers and scholars, I think that um, just allowing people to have the space that they need to define their own research questions and ensure that these things are actually uh, brought forward by the community and by representatives within the community in order to have a successful um, research project. I think that all of the things that Brunhilder uh, mentioned earlier as far as ecosystem services and ensuring that we do have a healthy ecosystem in order to continue not only um, economic practices, but cultural practices, those are all things that are very holistic and very much at the forefront of a lot of indigenous thought and indigenous research. And so I think that um, a part of the decolonization of not only the institutions, but of the research uh, pieces actually have to do with uh, that communications piece and understanding um, that the, the shift needs to be um, uh, the inclusion of indigenous communities and Arctic communities at the, at the um, when you initiate these sorts of projects and that type of, um, any type of research really. Yes, and uh, it really goes to knowledge co-production, right, Liza? I mean, it's uh, not just including or consulting, actually engaging it directly in the research process. And ideally, from the very start, right, from defining what you want to do to defining the methods, and then, uh, of course, uh, working with outcomes and working with communities to collect data and all these other things, and also uh, sharing outcomes and discussing it and revising it based on on that co-production. So I think that's uh, the process of co-production, I think is the way to decolonize uh, scientific research um, in the Arctic, if not just in the Arctic. I mean, of course, it's important to remember that when uh, you know our institutions, as Eliza also said, our institutions are colonial. Uh, the, the, the Western institutions that uh, sort of prof, uh, you know support our science. And I mean, to make sure that we realize that and then we work with it to alleviate this by engaging in knowledge co-production. I think that's that's the way to go. Yeah, I can maybe follow up a little bit. I think I think you two guys have all have basically answered this question very well very, very well. So it's not so much that I can add to it, but I think that uh, exactly what Lisa Lisa said that uh, I mean the indigenous people they are the specialists of their ecosystems. They are the right persons to ask, what is a sustainable area within your field? How can we as researchers or scientists come in and get your knowledge? What do you want to put, what do you want us to research, to do research on? Because you are the specialists within your ecosystems and you would know what to, what to um, have the emphasis on within your uh, area. In, uh, so I think that a great cooperation uh, is the most important key thing here. Thank you. Um, on to another topic that we hear a lot about in the Arctic, climate change adaptation and mitigation. 
And um, so someone has asked if there's any discussion within the Arctic Council on direct action and mitigation, for example, is there any discussion about having kind of Arctic United nationally determined commitments in light of the Paris Agreement? How far is the Paris Agreement integrated into discussions in the Arctic Council? Maybe I should ask that to Einar. Yes, thank you, Rachel. And the simple answer is that the Arctic Council is, of course, focusing uh, uh, a lot on climate change. And, uh, but uh, if, we, if, we, uh, if we look at the work of the Arctic Council in relation to climate change, it is mostly focusing on uh, adaptation and resilience. Uh, uh, mitigation has not as such been so much on the agenda of the Arctic Council. And probably one of the reasons for that is that the, uh, uh, we do not have a lot uh, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, global effect uh, sort of uh, coming from the Arctic. Uh, there are rather few people living up in the Arctic and uh, it is more about uh, so, sort of the other way around. The Arctic could sometimes be described as the, as the uh, canary in the mine. Uh, we feel the effects uh, maybe more dramatically and earlier uh, than others. Uh, and therefore the focus has been so strongly rather on adaptation and resilience more than uh, than mitigation. And let's just face it, you know, uh, we have no choice. Uh, even with a fully implemented uh, Paris Agreement, uh, we would still have to anticipate that we would see dramatic uh, rise in temperature uh, in the Arctic in the next uh, two to three decades. And that's the best case scenario. Uh, uh, le so let's not even uh, allow us to think about uh, the mid case or, or, or worst case scenarios we are simply forced uh, uh, to deal uh, with the effects. Uh, however, uh, it turns out uh, sort of in terms of our success in, in doing mitigation on a global scale. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one another question's come in regarding the use of modern technology. And one thing we've discovered in the last week or so is maybe we didn't need to fly halfway around to all these meetings. I just heard an extremely successful a model Arctic Council with some very bright and enthusiastic young people this week. Um, but we also have problems in the Arctic with connectivity that we've already heard about. We know that many Arctic communities, particularly indigenous communities, um, do not have good internet connection. But how far do you think we can, if we improve the communications, actually reduce some of the impacts that we make just by traveling around to these meetings? How much do you think we can move towards online cooperation rather than uh, flying around to these enormous gatherings like we, like we have right now? You want me to start or? <laughs> Who would like to take that ball? Maybe Alev Tina, you're young and you're probably way ahead of us on the time. I'm just picking on you because you're about 15 years younger than me and you probably know things about uh, social media. Right, okay. <laughs> this is really, uh, yeah, interesting question indeed. I was also thinking myself today, so actually to which degree we can uh, um, decrease our traveling in the future. Uh, because uh, this is a really big surprise how this conference uh, has been uh, going on today. So it's, uh, I think it's a great success. So thanks a lot to the organizers for putting everything in such short term. And um, regarding the uh, communication and interaction, yes, of course, we can stay on the social media. Yes, we can have such uh, beautiful pl platforms as we are using today. Uh, though at the same time, I think we cannot uh, fully replace the person-to-person uh, um, -person interaction because it is very different still when you, you meet somebody and you have the same idea and you can uh, have this uh, life interaction. It gives more boost, it gives more creativity. You're not uh, having the lacks of the internet and then something like, can you hear me? Can you hear me again? And this is uh, what is uh, breaking up the whole, I would say, communication sometimes. So I think this uh, live face-to-face -face interaction would be still important, though, of course, diminishing and um, decreasing our travels uh, shows many positive impacts right now across the globe. Taking the Venice or taking the air pollution in China or many other parts of the world. But please feel free to add. So 
what you might think as well. Yeah, can Thank, I? Thank you. Would someone else like to come in, Andrew? Yeah, I just, just want to say that, of course, as a social scientist, I would say that you know, interpersonal communication is very important, but uh, I think we should have a balance here. I mean, uh, so, so engage both uh, those technologies that could be helpful, uh, keeping in mind that not everyone has access to them, not everyone is, feels comfortable in connecting through social media through other means, but also make sure that we still have uh, opportunities for in-personal meetings, whether it's for uh, boosting creativity or to basically conceive any ideas, but also essentially to remaining uh, sort of uh, human, human beings. I think it is uh, important also that the message of if we were to reduce connecting as scientists, it's not just the science that does it, that all other parts of society do it. Otherwise, we will end up with us being unable to, say, conceive new ideas or do some important work while others will be doing the way they have been doing for, for, forever. So we need to make sure that, that messaging is resonating with other parts of society. Then I think that would be an important way to uh, to balance balance it better. So I think that's the idea. Thank you, Liza. Did you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I guess that uh, I would just say that it's really nice to see everybody. I had expected to see so many of you in person. Uh, this week that it's just kind of a, it's kind of sad that we're not all together. Um, and so, I mean, I see it from both perspectives, really. I think that um, uh, within our Aleut communities, we, we really wouldn't have the option to meet like this. And so, um, so it goes kind of both ways. Um, we don't have the, uh, the connectivity and what we need to participate fully, I don't think, with um, when people are out in our region. I live in Anchorage, and so I do have, you know, a stable internet connection, um, but in a, lot of, a lot of times we don't have that. And so um, traveling to the meetings and actually making that face-to-face -face connection is a huge part of, I think, um, the the ability to share ideas and to um, also share uh, questions and concerns and build the relationships that, uh, that we need, especially at the Arctic Council level and national, international levels um, to kind of uh, build those relationships that we need to move policy forward and to um, be able to have uh, the influence that, that, that we have sometimes, so. Um, uh, thank you, Liza. Now we have another, the concluding session starts in 15 minutes, so we were not permitted to run over this time uh, into the coffee break. But just one very brief question addressed to Liza was how um, research at the science policy interface can actually support gender equality in terms of sustainability in the Arctic. It was addressed to Liza, but I think it might also be of interest to other panelists. Did I put you on the spot? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think that everything that we've been talking about kind of um, kind of speaks to that in 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 a sense. Um, uh, from our perspective, I think that uh, that gender equality also includes um, making sure that the males in our communities are involved in research and in science and in education. Um, and so we have a different uh, perspective a little bit as far as what gender equality looks like. You know, we want to make sure that we are including the, the young uh, males in, in uh, making sure that they still have a place within our, within our societies and having the education that we need to uh, have uh, good leaders that are both male and female. And so I think that being able to be involved in uh, policy um, and science is, is just very, very important. And I think that we've kind of touched on that a whole bunch during this, uh, this panel. Um, so I think I will go ahead and give the floor to somebody else that would like to maybe talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, I don't think we've time to take any more questions, but if anyone would like to make a final word, Ainer, you haven't spoken for a while, is there something you'd like to bring in? Well, thank you, Rachel. I think uh, maybe just, you know, uh, to commend the organizers of, of uh, coming up with this uh, solution to the big challenge of all of us now, uh, of course, stemming from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, 
we were scheduled to be in Akureyri as well, the Arctic Council, in the in the, in the last couple of days, uh, having our meetings, and uh, we did not feel confident of moving them online uh, all together. But we will certainly be uh, thinking about uh, 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 sort of opening up for those possibilities. But I think I think it points to one particular things relating to sustainability, and that is uh, uh, in the Arctic we will always be. Uh, dependent upon uh, upon travels and communications and 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 transport uh, to probably to a greater greater degree than than those that are living in in more populated areas, and this has been with us for a long time. Uh, one of the first uh, one of the first, if not the first, international treaties that was conducted uh, in the name or, or on behalf of Iceland, even though that it was not a nation state at that time, is is generally deemed to be from 1262, and it was about the number of ships that would sail to Iceland uh, when Icelanders became subjects to the Norwegian king. And uh, uh, the current pandemic has reminded us of this. We are very busy uh, trying to make sure that we keep transport lines open in the current situation. Uh, so here we are, uh, some uh, several hundred years uh, later, dealing with the same challenges. But the other side of it is, that we should also remember that we should develop, develop our societies in such a manner uh, that we can still survive uh, when we have interruptions uh, like we are currently dealing with. And I think that speaks directly to, uh, to the importance of uh, indigenous knowledge uh, that was being referenced uh, earlier. So that would probably be my parting remarks. Um, we have approximately 12 seconds left. So, Einar, thank you very much for a perfect round off for our session. Thanks to all our panelists. Thanks to people who sent in questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get through them all. A question like, what is a sustainable art We could have had a whole conference just on that and still not run out of questions. But thank you for all of you for taking part. Um, thank you for everyone who joined us online. And I look forward to hearing from uh, the final session. Thank you also organizers, Alan especially. <laughs>